Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much to JGI for the invitation. I'm really delighted to be here, and thank you to all of y'all, as we say in North Carolina, for sticking around. Um, my title was actually about uh, chemical communication in the microbiome. That is what we study in the Shank Lab. I'm going to borrow a line from Victoria Orphan yesterday and say that's quite an expansive title. And so what I'm going to kind of focus in on today is about uh, not only how at the Shank Lab we're trying to study cell-cell communication and interactions, but the system we're developing to look at cell-cell interactions and communications in a spatially resolved, spatially explicit way um, with these model soil micro, uh, microcosms that we're developing. As I don't have to tell this audience, uh, we live in what is very much a microbial world, and one of the really amazing things about microbial ecology, I think, to many of us is that it really highlights the awesome power of large numbers. So a uh, tiny um, cyanobacterium, which is just a few microns wide when it gets together with many, many of its conspecifics can actually be seen from space. And uh, we can see that this kind of like massive collective activity is what has really made our world into a living earth and has been responsible for uh, basically creating the biosphere as we know it today. And of course, we know other examples of this gigantic scaling up. Uh, microbes have, prokaryotes have done feats of geoengineering, like creating stromatolites. And of course, there are massive players in the carbon cycle. In large numbers, they basically make the carbon cycle run and are responsible for making nutrients liberated for the rest of the food web. So we could say of microbes and prokaryotes in in particular, that they may be small, but they are mighty. Uh, and part of actually what makes this interesting is not just that uh, microbes need to, uh, that microbes will basically do their own thing and in large numbers their activities scale up. Uh, to have large-scale biosphere consequences, but actually that microbes sometimes have to act collectively in order for their own survival. So one example that I'm going to uh, focus in on today is, of course, microbial decomposition, which is a uh, collective activity. And to see why this is the case, um, I'll give a couple historical examples. So in 1997, Rosenberg and colleagues uh, published this paper on Myxococcus xanthus, where they found that when you plate Myxococcus, the bacterium on a complex substrate, like casein in this case, that if they don't, if um, the inoculum size basically really, really matters in terms of predicting when growth is going to happen. So if you uh, plate or spot just a few cells in the singles or tens, you don't see any growth at all. Uh, if they, when you plate uh, hundreds of cells, you'll see growth in about 15 days. And when you plate a, billion, a million cells, then we start to see growth within a day. So this initial inoculum size really matters. And we can see why in this nice figure uh, from Kashanowicz where they're talking about uh, extracellular enzyme production in yeasts. Basically, extracellular enzymes produced by single cells, uh, the extracellular enzymes diffuse away from the cells faster than the decompositions can act, d decomposition products can diffuse back to the cells. So the local monosaccharide concentrations end up being too low to support cell growth. Whereas when we have a cell cluster, together these cells can actually increase the local concentration enough so that they can support the growth of all of the cells together. So if the physics of decomposition is basically kind of against microbes where they're producing extracellular enzymes only to have them diffuse away, why are they doing it? Why not keep the enzymes on the inside? And of course, this is because of another physical constraint, which is the cell size. So here's an example of a gram-negative bacteria um, cell wall and membrane. And there are these geometric constraints on what the size of any one of these outer, uh, these cell wall uh, proteins or the internal cell wall transporters can be. So we end up with these small proteins. And that constrains the upper limit of import into a prokaryotic cell at about 600 Daltons, or the size of a trisaccharide. To, and so to appreciate how very small this is, uh, consider just a standard plant leaf, 
who that has all of these cell walls that are packed with these really complicated mazes of cellulose. Each one of these cellulose fibers is composed of really long chains of glucose strung together. And uh, any given bacterium can really only import the cellulose three sugars at a time. So it really helps us appreciate the great feat of decomposition. And we start to see that as a consequence of this small size, we end up with very big consequences. As a function of small size, bacteria have to act extracellularly, but also collectively. And this, all these little dramas about, you know, are there enough cells around? Can they actually decompose the substrate? Will some of them actually produce the enzymes, or will some of them kind of sit back and not produce any enzymes? Uh, can the enzymes and actually reach the substrates, or are they actually lost in the complex maze of the soil? All of these little dramas uh, scale up to having very large consequences for our biosphere. For example, this question of whether soil carbon is actually going to be evolved and released into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide, or whether it's going to stay sequestered in the soil. So decomposition is this multi-scale process that's happening at these interdependent scales. And we do have very different tools for looking at decomposition at all of these scales, and each of these scales really matters. So at the picometer and nanometer scale, we have great tools from molecular and structural biology to see what's happening within cells. Um, at the centimeter and kilometer scales, we have uh, bulk soil sampling, we have aerial photography, all kinds of techniques there for very large scale studies. Um, but what we're really missing are things that are happening at the micro and meso scales. And this is the scale at which we want to understand not just what's happening within cells, but how they're interacting and whether they're cooperating or not, what the consequences are for their survival as well as for decomposition itself. And this is where our group really wanted to focus in and develop more tools for ourselves and for the community to understand what's happening in soils at these scales, where we see a real dearth of available technologies. These are the scales where things like light microscopy really come in handy and can do a lot of work. But of course, when we're thinking about something like soil, we're dealing with um, basically an optical nightmare because it's uh, incredibly difficult, of course, to image uh, in soils. Um, but it is nonetheless an important to understand these processes at this scale. So this is where we decided to focus in. And uh, what we, we got a lot of um, great support from the USDOE Office of Bioimaging Technology to work with uh, excellent international interdisciplinary uh, collaborative team. Um, and what this team wanted to do was we wanted to establish a multimodal imaging platform to visualize activity in soil-like environments. We wanted to be able to visualize the assembly of interspecies and interkingdom communities within these soil-like environments. And we even wanted to see whether we could visualize the movement of carbon in these soil communities. And so that's what I'm talking to you about today, uh, about some of the progress we've made on this project. The backbone of the project is something called transparent soil, which uh, is based on Nafion. This is a synthetic fluoropolymer that can be milled to various sizes. So what I'm showing you is what Nafion looks like kind of to the naked eye. That's about a centimeter wide uh, tube. And this is what it looks like when we stain it and look at it under a confocal microscope. The Nafion has this great property that when you add water, it basically becomes opti optically clear because it has the same refractive index as water. So using this, we can create um, a little world. This actually looks very much like that. Um, what we see is this lovely uh, maze of air pores and water pores. And these little water pores, or kind of liquid areas, are where we expect microbes to live and thrive. This is the kind of microhabitat that we expect to see in a complex matrix like soil. We can use the nafion to actually um, produce, to get volumes as well. So this is a two photon stack that I took at Woods Hole. It's 75 microns. Oh, dear. 
I don't think the video is working, but uh, imagine it rotating as a cube, and it has this very nicely, thank you very much. <laughs> um, we see pretty good, re we have a uh, pretty fine resolution of each of these Bacillus cereus filaments, uh, even up to 75 microns in the system. And we can even uh, visualize in four dimensions, so over time, and this is really the killer app, as the kids say, on the system, because uh, it's really difficult to get dynamic information in soil-like systems. Usually we have to use really destructive techniques, um, but in these microcosms, we can actually look at the same cells over time. Here's Bacillus subtilis, when we first inoculated into uh, a transparent soil microcosm with a relatively rich nutrient, and we can see it form these filaments and disaggregate over time and start to divide anew within three, hour, uh, three days, actually. So we've been able to find the same points over and over again and visualize over time. So we have indeed established this multimodal imaging platform. We can use it on all these different kinds of microscopes that uh, can basically be optimized for whatever application is. So if we want really deep volumes, we might use two photon. If we really want to kind of get quick dynamics, we could use uh, fluorescence. And so we can use all these to visualize the assembly of these uh, communities and where things are in space and over time. Uh, but what really adds a lot more power to the system is the ability to integrate Raman microspectroscopy because this gets us at our third aim and allows us to actually explore the movement of carbon in these communities. Raman microspectroscopy works by uh, basically, it's a little like fluorescence imaging in that we excite our sample and what we're measuring is the inelastic scattering of a photon. And we can use the Raman effect to actually see which cells in a population have taken up, uh, for example, an isotopic label. So in this figure, we're seeing E. coli cells that were grown in 13C glucose, and their phenylalanine trace or peak is shifted to the left of cells that have been grown mostly on 12C glucose. So we can use this. Um, the signal to look at which cells have incorporated an isotopic label. It's our collaborators at University of Vienna, David Berry and Martin Palatinsky, that are the real uh, experts in Raman. And uh, their system really offers a ton of advantages. It's fast, it's non-destructive, uh, it enables dynamic and live cell imaging, so they have an optical tweezer that we can use. I've actually done this. You can see a cell that's swimming in a microcosm, kind of trap it for 30 seconds, take its Raman signal, release it, and it just goes off and, and lives its life. So this is great because we can actually get um, live cell data. And we can even track multiple isotopes, um, C13 labels, as well as deuterium or heavy water labels. And deuterium can be used to get uh, information about which cells are metabolically active in a population. So what we wanted to do originally was to uh, use our system to look at decomposition of plant polysaccharides, and we still want to do this, but as we thought about it, we realized that fungal polysaccharides actually had some real advantages, uh, especially as a starting point. Um, and this is because fungi as heterotrophs can really easily be made uh, isotopically can easily be labeled isotopically because all you have to do is take your spores, grow them in a C13 carbon source, and then you get C13 labeled fungus. Whereas for getting plant polysaccharides, there's a much more complicated set setup of um, supplying them with carbon dioxide. So we wanted uh, something that would be sort of simple, efficient, inexpensive, and accessible. Uh, so we wanted to work with plant uh, with fungi, and also there's some advantages in terms of um, the fact that these can be used as both carbon and nitrogen sources. Their chitin and chitosans are nitrogen rich as well as carbon rich. Um, and of course, they're uh, natural, naturally found polymers that are still important for ecosystems that we care about. So what we should be able to see is that if we grow our spores in C13 glucose, we will end up with uh, a labeled fungus. And what we should see under the mi Raman microscope is this shift. Uh, because it's a eukaryotic organism, we should see a shift both in the phenylalanine and the thymine peaks. So we did do this experiment, and indeed that is what we saw. Uh, we can grow 
these mucor organisms in our microcosms, and we see that if we grow them in a 12C labeled glucose, then the phenylalanines over here, but if we grow them in C13 labeled glucose, then we see these very nice peak shifts indicating that we have really nicely labeled and evenly la labeled uh, fungi. So now that we have our substrate, uh, we're actually feeding it to a organism, Bacillus subtilis, which you might know as a model, model organism uh, for genetics and molecular biology, but it also is, it, believe it or not, it has an ecology as well. It didn't just uh, show up in the lab one day. It is found uh, ubiquitously in soils, and even though we think of bacilli as primarily spore formers in the soils, they actually uh, can be found in their vegetative state when they are in proximity to dead fungi. So this indicates that maybe they are, in fact, uh, decomposing dead fungi in the wild. They're prolific decomposers with many polysaccharide degrading enzymes, and they do have a chitosinase and are able to break down fungal cell walls. So we did find that, indeed, uh, Bacillus subtilis can decompose dead mucor fragilis. Um, so if you just have mucor alone, it looks like this. You see these aggregates, and you have a ton of fungal biomass. If you add wild-type Bacillus subtilis, it's decomposed very, very nicely. And uh, if you knock out the chitosinase gene, we end up with some decomposition, but definitely not full decomposition. So it really does need this chitosinase enzyme, which is excreted ex extracellularly to decompose. And Bacillus subtilis can use mucor as a sole carbon source. You just put it in minimal salts with uh, a dead mucor uh, hyphae, and it'll grow very nicely. And I should say it can also use mucor as a sole carbon and nitrogen source. On top of that, we were excited to find that uh, Bacillus subtilis actually does form these nice aggregates and biofilms on these fungi. So this is a new discovery for us. It was known that Bacillus subtilis will colonize plant roots, but no one had shown that it can also colonize uh, fungal hyphae. So we see these nice aggregates, and we can actually even see that Bacillus subtilis is turning on its biofilm genes when it is close to the, the mucor hypha. So if we put this all together, we take our C13-labeled mucor, we add some Bacillus subtilis and let it form its aggregates, uh, we can, and we know that the subtilis is going to decompose the mucor and take up its uh, carbon, we can ask a sort of fundamental question, how does the availability of free carbon affect decomposition? So if we add something, a kind of cheap available food source that's easy to uh, live off of, what's going to happen? Is it actually going to live off of the mucor or is it going to take up just the free sugar? Um, one possibility is that, yeah, they're going to stop degrading and take the free sugar instead. But also what could be happening is that because they get the extra energy, they might just grow more, produce more enzymes, and we end up with more decomposition. So we can use the Raman microspectroscopy to actually get at this question. What we did was we grew Bacillus subtilis just by itself with no mucor. And this is the, the Raman spectrum we get. If we grow it with a C13 labeled mucor, we can see really clearly that it's gotten its carbon from the mucor. So we see this really nice phenylalanine shift, and we know, yeah, that was uh, all, all of it is coming from the mucor because that's the only place it could have possibly gotten its carbon from. But now if we add a bunch of free sugar, this time in the form of, of glycerol, we see that the bacillus actually didn't take up any of the... Uh, carbon from the mucor. It looks basically the way it did when it was grown without any C13. So it's getting all of its um, nutrients from the glycerol. So this means we know that you know our uh, isotopes are working. We can definitely detect uh, the signal, and we can see the uptake in Bacillus subtilis. And we've used it to show that actually we the the presence of a free sugar will suppress decomposition. And now we can use it to ask even finer scale questions like which specific microbes benefit from, de from decomposition. So, you know, are these little clusters taking up more of the C13? Do they have to be big clusters? Can they be little clusters? Do the planktonic cells get any of this C13 carbon? Are they too far away to actually take up the C13? We can ask all of this in our system. Um, and we can also ask, on top of that, whether enzyme producers 
get more of the products of decomposition than non-producers. So we've created a uh, reporter, a uh, chitosinase reporter that's hooked up to a fluorescent protein, and we can see it's bright, it's on when we grow Bacillus subtilis on chitosan, but of course this is a colony level phenotype. We don't know what the actual expression is, what individual cells are doing. And, uh, but we can, in our system, ask, um, using the, the reporter, we can see which particular cells are producing the chitosinase enzyme, but then we can also ask, which, using the ramen, which cells have taken up the C13 label. And this gives us a level of resolution that we don't think has actually been uh, looked at before. Many people have been really interested in this question of decomposition and competition between extracellular enzyme producers and potential teeters, um, but we haven't had the tools to look in a really deep and detailed way at what specifically is happening to the partition of decomposition products um, and how to overlay that with data about who specifically is producing enzymes and who is not. And of course we want to know, since this is all about space and soils, we also want to be able to look at this both in a just a liquid system, but also look at how spatial structure is going to affect the distribution of these decomposition products. Uh, we're doing all of this in these little microfluidics devices because they're really easy to transport uh, between different platforms. This is my uh, colleague Martin Palatinsky's brainchild. He's a wonderful engineer. Uh, he's the postdoc at University of Vienna who we've been working with. And uh, these are designed to trap the transparent soil within the microcosms and uh, they're very small volumes and are pretty inexpensive, and you can just kind of uh, build these on your bench top, or rather I can, which means that you can. Certainly, it's pretty easy. Um, so the, the, we can get these stationary incubations that are allowed that will actually sustain these ecosystems for over a month. I've got a couple in the incubator that have been going for a couple months, and I still see cells happily living within them. Uh, we also have a flow system going. Uh, Martin divide this, devised this bubble trap so we don't get any bubbles in there, and he's been able to run these uh, flow systems for at least five days. So this allows us to add some naturalistic kind of flow speeds. Uh, if you think about the rate at which water might percolate through a soil, we're getting flow rates that are about that low. And that means that we can look at questions of whether uh, bacteria will remain, let's say, uh, attached to a substrate even in the presence of flow. This is one of our, um, basically we put in some uh, spores into our transparent soil, grew it up in the C13 glucose, so we can see these little transparent soil particles, but we also see this lovely web of hyphae of uh, the mucor as it's getting into the little spaces between the transparent soil. This is just a normal DIC image under 10X. This is what it looks like under a confocal microscope. So here are the particles in green. The fungal autofluorescence uh, shows up here in the magenta, so we don't even actually have to label our fungi, which is really nice. And uh, if we zoom in, we can see these little uh, Bacillus subtilis bacteria are actually kind of finding a, a home on this fungal filament. Uh, I should have mentioned that we actually heat killed these uh, fungi in advance, so they're not uh, living and continuing to move through the transparent soil. They're kind of forming this network and then we're giving them over to our bacteria as a, a nutrient source. Uh, this is just on epifluorescent microscope. We can see these little aggregates that are forming on mucor as well. And we think these aggregates might be, play an important role in decomposition because again, here they are working in larger numbers. So we think maybe having these aggregates allows them to actually carry out decomposition. This is a, kind of a poor fluorescent image, but basically what we're showing here is that even on our Raman microscope, we can localize the fluorescence and see where the cells are, and we can seamlessly go and take the Raman image on the same microscope, or alternatively, we can move it to a better microscope, a confocal, uh, and we can use, because we're using water immersion lenses on both, we, that makes the transfer pretty easy to get those two types of data. And again, the reason we want those two types of data and want to be able to overlay them is because we want to know what 
not only who's producing enzymes and who's not, but who's benefiting from the products of decomposition. So I was in Vienna uh, this November, and uh, Martin and I were doing a lot of work to get the system up and running, validating it, uh, showing you all the data that we have here. I'm actually returning uh, in a couple months. So I'll be there in May and June, and I am going to answer this very question. So uh, catch me maybe at ISME if you're there and ask me how it went, <laughs> if, you'd, if you'd like to know. Um, I'm excited to to report back at some point what the results of this experiment are going to be. So to conclude, um, I just wanted to share with you this work that we've been doing on this project. Hopefully, it'll be useful not only to our lab, but maybe it could become a tool for you and some of the projects that you're interested in. Uh, we have been able to establish this multimodal imaging platform, visualize the assembly of uh, interspecies and interkingdom interactions in soil communities, and we've been able to show the movement of carbon in soil communities. And what we'd really love to do next um, is uh, to actually add a chemical imaging component. So we've been in conversation with our colleagues at EMSL, uh, Chris Anderton and Venki Prabhakaran, about potentially adding a nanodesi uh, and IMS-MS component to this. So that means we could not only see sort of who took up the carbon in a given system, but actually be able to map in a spatially explicit way where the decomposition products are. And uh, our favorite question in the Shank Lab, which is where are the secondary metabolites? What are their distributions? Can we actually visualize uh, what these organisms are putting out and uh, as signaling molecules and as uh, antibiotics? Um, so with that, I... Uh, Hope I've convinced you that it's important to understand soils at the micro and meso scales, and uh, I'm excited to continue to make progress in that direction. And wanted to acknowledge all of the, the great folks who've been working on this project, my colleagues at University of North Carolina and at University of Vienna. And with many thanks to the USDOE, to the JGI for the invitation, and to the Bioimaging Research Program for the funding and support. Thank you very much. Thank you.